Welcome back to Calculus 3. Today we will talk about vector valued functions. And these should look a little familiar here. We're going to say r of t, right, is going to be equal to a vector. And we'll say we have f of t, uh, g of t, and h of t. Now this is one way we can see it, right? Again, it should look familiar as far as parametric equations that we saw in Calc 2. Uh, another way we can see it is what I call physics notation. And we'll say f of t i plus g of t uh, j, sorry, we're getting the letters here, plus h of t k. So we're just seeing all the different forms that we could encounter. And again, what is each one of these pieces, right? We have our x component, y, and z component, known as the component functions. So just to explicitly write them out, right, x is equal to f of t, y is equal to g of t, and of course z is equal to, right, h of t. And I want you to think of this, right, I'll have a visual down here now. My visual is in two-dimensional space, but think of this as tracking a particle through space, right, or tracking its path through space. Again, mine is a two-dimensional. Uh, what this is, is this is Halley's Comet traveling in an ellipse, right, with the sun at one of the foci. So there's that. Now what we're going to want to do with this is build upon this so that we can perform calculus. In order to do that, right, we're going to have to go through domain, limits, finally we can get to derivatives and then integrals. But we want to be able to calculate, we'll write it over here, a few different things that we'll get into as far as applications. Velocity, right, so if this is our position function, how do we calculate velocity? It's actually very straightforward if we're okay with our calculus one. Acceleration, try not to misspell. Right, so what is velocity in relation to position? What is acceleration in relation to position and velocity? And the last two that we'll try to take a look at will be arc length and curvature. Right, and this might not be till the next video, but just to fast forward a little bit. So again, we have our two dimensional drawing here. We'll add some three dimensional drawings. The next parts of these videos will get into domain and limits and we will build from there. So I will see you in the next part of the video. All right, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into domain of these vector valued functions, right? So we're gonna give you a couple uh, examples here. Let's start off with, uh, we'll go over here. R of t is going to be equal to, and I'll write this one in vector format t squared natural log of 2 minus t and let's do the square root of t minus 1. Now a little bit different than a typical domain problem, why? Because we have three different functions, right? So in order to solve this what we need to do is break this down for each component and find the domain of each component. So let's do that first. So we have x is equal to t squared. We don't have any domain issues, right? So I'll just put over here. The domain is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity. Right? What about natural log of 2 minus t, right? Our y component. What do we think? Well, what can we not take the natural log of? Negative numbers and also the value of zero, right? So zero is not included in this set. So we can start at, if I plug in two, I'll get zero. So I can start at two, anything less than two. Oh, actually we can go to a maximum of two, my mistake. And we can go from negative infinity all the way to positive two, but positive two is not included. And finally, for our y component, or z component, sorry, we have the square root of t minus 1, and its domain, 
Well, what can we not do? We can't take the square root of negative numbers. We can take the square root of zero. So it looks like we can start at one and we can go to positive infinity, right? Infinities always get the parentheses. Now, in order to solve this, we have to see where do these intersect or overlap, right? Well, negative infinity to positive infinity, no restrictions. We don't really care about it too much. So we're mainly looking at these last two functions, where in this case, right, our lower bound is one is included and our upper bound is two, but it's not included, right? So the domain of R of T, say domain of R of T is just going to be positive one, two, two, right? Very small domain. And that is it, right? So that is our first example. We're going to go ahead and do one more just so we get used to the process. But again, all we're doing is we're looking at each one of the component functions. We're finding its domain and then we're finding the intersection of those domains, right? So let's put, we'll draw a squiggly, give ourselves some separation and we'll do the same thing one more time. So let's go ahead. We will do R of T. And let's see if we can write this in physics notation now is equal to we'll do sine of t i comma oh, plus sorry plus natural log of t j plus one over t minus three k. Sorry about that comma there, don't worry about it. Okay, so same idea, we need to break it up into three pieces or three component functions. Let's go ahead and write these out. What do we have? We have x is equal to sine of t, and I have no domain restrictions, so we do need to know, right, our domain of each of our functions here. No domain restrictions for sine, right, so we can just say domain, negative infinity, positive infinity, perfect. We look at our next piece there, natural log of t. We talked about it up here. Now we don't have a two minus t, this is actually the, right, the easier version of the parent function. We'll say natural log of t. And again, this is positive values, so we can go from zero to infinity. And what's our last one here? Our very last one is a one over T minus three, right? Well, in this case, we can't include three, but we can include everything else, right? So let's see our Z, which is one over T minus three. The domain here is going to be, well, we can go from negative infinity all the way to negative three or to positive three, sorry all the way to positive three, a union three to infinity, right? And I'll make a little square here for me to fit in the domain. So let's go ahead, we'll box out a little piece here. Right, so again, we're looking for the overlap of these two, of these pieces here. Well, again, the negative infinity to infinity doesn't, right, doesn't restrict us at all. However, we have zero to infinity, right? And over here we have negative infinity to three and three to infinity, right? So what we end up with is a lower bound of zero. I'm gonna assume we know it's the domain, right? So our answer is gonna be from zero to three, union three to infinity. All right, and just so we know, so it's fully labeled, I'll write it below. Right, this is our domain of R of T. All right, so we wanna be able to take this concept, right, and we're gonna transfer it over to limits now, right? So when we're doing the limits of these functions, and then we'll take our idea of limits and transfer it to continuity, right? So we will do those steps in the following videos, and I will see you there. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and start talking about limits of vector valued functions. And first thing I'm going to do is let's just define 
right, an abstract vector valued function, we'll call it r of t, is going to be equal to, we'll write it in vector format, we'll say f of t, g of t, and h of t, right, each of these being component functions. And let's say I'm interested in finding the limit of r of t. Ooh, there we go. The limit of r of t as t goes to some value here, we'll call it a. Right, well, all I have to do, it's actually very straightforward. I just have to take this limit and distribute it to each one of my component functions. Right, so this is now going to be the limit as t goes to a, it'll be a little bit tedious to write this all out, f of t, the limit as t goes to a, g of t, and the limit as t goes to a of h of t. There we go. Awesome. Okay, so essentially if we know how to do our calc 1 material right using our finding limits, then we should be good because we just have three times as much work, but the process is the same. Now know that the limit laws, as well as L'Hopital's rule, which I will reference here, can be used as well, right? Just because we learned it in Calc 1, we're in Calc 3, we don't get to forget about it. We still need to use it. So let's go ahead, we'll do an example. So let's say we're gonna find the limit, and we'll draw a squiggly here. We'll do the limit as t goes to zero, and I'll put this in physics notation, e of negative three t i plus t cubed over sine cubed t j plus, let's do cosine of three t k. There we go. Okay, now two of these should be fairly easy, right? This means, again, we're splitting this up into its components. So we're just gonna do each component one by one. Two of these, these two should be fairly straightforward. The middle one might take a little bit of work in remembering from our Calculus 1 course. So let's go ahead, we have our first one, the limit as t goes to zero, of e to the negative 3t. Well, what's the very first thing we learn to do with limits? If we can plug in the value, we should just go for it. In this case, I can plug in zero. I have e to the negative three times zero, e to the zero, we get one. All right, so that is our first one. Let's go ahead, I'm gonna put a comma here. Or I guess I'll do a semicolon just so we know. Our next one is gonna be the limit as t goes to zero, and I'm going to rewrite this, right? So we're going to do this in between step. This is t over sine of t cubed. And I'm just going to leave this right there so we can think about it. So we'll get back to it in a second, right? This is the, the one that requires a little bit more thought. This one, right, cosine of 3t, the limit as t goes to 0 of cosine of 3t, and again, what do we know? If we can just plug in zero, right, cosine of three times zero, cosine of zero, we get one, right? So always check first if we can just plug it in, right? The reason why we didn't plug it in in the middle is if I plug in zero, I get zero over zero, right? Also known as indeterminate form. So maybe maybe some of us realize, okay, indeterminate form, let's go ahead and bring back L'Hopital's rule. Well. We also want to bring back one of our limit laws that allows us to bump this power out to the outside. It's going to make life a lot easier, right? So we can save this power. What, the, what our limit laws say is that if I can find the limit of this piece here, let's go ahead and underline it, I can worry about the cubed later, right, at the very end, right? So I'm going to do a little bit of side work here because, again, even with this, if we plug in zero, we still end up with indeterminate form, zero over zero, right? So let's go ahead, we'll do a little bit of side work over here. But let's go ahead and do L'Hopital's rule, right? We know the ratio will remain the same, so limit as t goes to zero, derivative of t 
one, derivative of sine of t, cosine of t, and now we can actually plug in that zero. Right now, if we plug in zero, what do we get? One over cosine of zero, one, one over one, one cubed, we get one. Awesome. Right, so after everything's said and done, right, what did we do here? We took the limit of r of t as t went to zero, and we ended up with the vector of ones. All right, so I think one example is good enough. Now we will need to take this moving forward. In the very next part of the video, we're gonna talk about space curves, and really we're just adding one piece uh, or two pieces in interval and continuity. All right, so I will see you in the next part of this video in space curves. Thanks guys. Okay, so this will be a fairly quick part of our video. I just wanna get some visualizations on what space curves are. Now essentially a space curve is going to be a vector valued function, r of t, right? So we have f of t, g of t, and h of t, as we always do. Except now we're gonna specify that, we're gonna add in another thing here, a few things, f, g, and h are all are continuous, real valued functions. Uh, we'll keep writing this way. What are we using this space for? Real valued functions on our interval on an interval i, right? Or on some interval, we just call it interval i. Right, so not only is it a vector valued functions, but they're also continuous, right? Well, what does it mean to be continuous? We should have a definition pop up over here. All it means for it to be continuous is that our limit is equivalent, right, to our location, right? If we take the limit as t goes to some value a, it should be equal to f of a at that actual point, right? So again, coming back from calculus one, definition should be there. So that's the extra specification. They should be continuous. Real value just means we have real numbers coming out of them on a interval i, right? So just an extra thing we're tacking on to define a space curve. Now let's go ahead and we're gonna visualize two of them. Right, so let's visualize one. We'll say r of t is equal to the vector cosine of t comma one over uh, 8t, the t is down in the numerator as well, comma, sine of t. All right, so a couple things to notice. First thing that we wanna notice with this is we have a cosine and a sine, right? We normally use this to parameterize what? A circle, well in this case our circle has a constant radius of one, right? Now the one that is missing is the z, or not the z, the y. Right, y is not dealing with this circle, it's kind of acting as a free variable in which we have a little bit of restriction 18t. But essentially what you're gonna see is this looks like a spiral, right, moving around the y axis, since this is the one left out here, but the radius is staying the same. So imagine a spiraling around the y axis, we should see it over here, but our radius is staying the same, and that is due to both of these being ones here. The reason why I'm pointing this out is because I'm gonna show a different one in a second, right? So again, notice that both of these radiuses are maintaining the same, right, the same length. And so when we're rotating around the Y axis, right, we're keeping the same radius with that spiral. So this is example one. Example two, same idea. We'll switch up a little bit. Let's say we have T cosine of T t sine of t, and we'll do the same, uh, we'll just leave it as t for right now. All right, so same idea, right, looking at the ones that are both cosine and sine, right, this is telling me I have, right, this kind of circle movement in my xy plane, 
and that my free variable z is the one that I am going around. So I'm spiraling around my z-axis, right? I'm spiraling around my z-axis, but what I need to notice is the difference between this one and the one above it is that now, right, my radius, as t is increasing, my radius is increasing, right? So as t is increasing, my radius is increasing, which means my spiral is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, as we can see from the visual. Right, so I wanted to look at these two specifically. Obviously, it's helpful to look at other ones. Feel free to play around with the Calc Plot 3D. Very helpful for all of this section. I will do some examples coming up here, just getting used to vector value problems and critical thinking. So I will see you in the next part. Okay, we're going to go through a couple examples just to get used to vector valued functions, right? Really, no calculus involved other than maybe. Uh, the shapes and surfaces we're going to deal with. So let's say, right, and the question should appear, I give you some vector value function, we'll say r of t is equal to, we'll put it in vector form, we'll say t zero, and let's do negative 3t squared plus 8t. So I give you some vector valued function, and I'm also going to say, right, I have the equation of a paraboloid here, right, from quadratic surfaces, and the question that I want to know is, where will these intersect, right? Where will my vector valued function and my paraboloid intersect, right? So maybe pause the video, think about it for a second. Okay, thanks for unpausing. Right, so now if they intersect, that means at some, at some point in time, right, they're going to be in the same location, right? The paraboloid is just the paraboloid, right? But this vector valued function is moving through, right, space, and eventually it's going to intersect this paraboloid, or it's going to, right, be at the same location as the paraboloid. So all I have to do is take my vector valued functions, right, and I'm just going to write it off to the side. I know that x is equal to t, right? I'm just writing my component functions. y is equal to 0. And z is equal to negative 3t squared plus 8t. So all I have to do in order to solve this is if I know these are my x values and I know they have to be equivalent over here, right, in order to intersect, I can just make this substitution. Right, so what is z equal? Negative 3t squared plus 8t plus 8t. Right, here's my z. It's equal to x squared, which is t squared, plus y squared, which is 0 squared. Okay, so now what are we doing? We just need to move everything to one side, right? So I'll move the t squared to the other side, and we end up with negative 4 t squared plus 8t is equal to 0. And now, right, this becomes an algebra problem. We need to factor out what we can, what can we factor out. Um, definitely a t and a 4. I'll do a negative 4 just to make life easier. So negative 4 t, this is now going to be just a t, minus 2 is equal to zero, and I end up with two different t values. And we can see from our visual over here that is true, right? There's two different values that we intersect at. We don't have the points yet, but we do have the t values, right? This tells me that negative four t is equal to zero, implies that t is equal to zero, and t minus two, of course, tells me, right, that t is equal to two. So we have two different t values. But the good news is we can take our t values, plug them into our component functions, and we're going to end up with our points. So we have one point, we'll just call it p1, of intersection, in which let's go ahead and plug in the easy one of 0. What do I end up with? I end up with 0, 0, 0, which is the origin. And again, we can see that from our visual. right? So one point of intersection at the origin. Let's see if this one's a little bit more interesting with point 2. Point two, if I plug it in, I get two, zero, and what do I have? Let's do some side work here. We have negative three times two squared, which is four, 
plus 8 times 2, which is 16. So negative 12 plus 16 or 4, right? So we have our two points here, right? Again, we can see from our visual that is true, right? So again, not so much uh, a calculus here. Obviously, the paraboloid is a quadratic surface, but just some critical thinking, right? If we have a vector value function and we have some quadratic surface, we want to know where they intersect. That means they must right, locate the same or be in the same space, uh, be, be at the same spot in space, right? So setting those equivalent to each other, right? Using our component functions, we can make the substitution, solve for two t values in this case, plug them back in, and we find our points of intersection.